Hi, everyone. Welcome in. I'm going to let some more people filter in here. But as you're coming in, um, feel free to introduce yourself with your name, pronouns, and where you're zooming in from in the chat. Hi, Chelsea. Welcome, welcome. Thanks all for introducing yourselves to each other in the chat. And I'll give a big welcome from all of us at Ohio Citizen Action. Thank you all for joining us today for our program, The Intersection of Racial Justice and Climate Action. I'm your host, Tatiana Radzos, the campaign's organizer here at Ohio Citizen Action. And before we start the program today, I'd like to go over some brief housekeeping issues. So at the bottom of your screen, looks like most of you have found the chat box. Please continue to make use of it. Um, again, introduce yourself with your name, pronouns, where you're coming in from and check back on the chat box for useful links and information that we'll be posting throughout the program. Also note the Q&A box. We will take questions at the end, so feel free to drop your questions there as they occur to you throughout the program. During our Q&A, we'll also get to as many previously submitted audience questions as time allows. And as well, closed captioning is enabled. So you can turn that on along the bottom of your screen. It's under the button live transcript. If you don't see it, you can go to more with the three dots and you can find live transcript there to add subtitles. And finally, if you'd like to stay up to date on the latest news and action alerts from Ohio Citizen Action, please text the word add to 216-586-6511 and join our texting program. And we'll put that number in the chat for you too. And now I'd like to introduce to you Ohio Citizen Action's Chief Executive Officer, Rachel Bells. Rachel has worked with Ohio Citizen Action since 1996, initially as the Cincinnati Program Director and later in other roles until 2013, when she became our CEO. During our time with us, she's led many successful and hard fought campaigns, including pioneering good neighbor campaigns that helped local communities work with nearby factories to reduce air and water pollution, preventing AMP Ohio from building a huge new coal plant and also helping to bring community choice aggregation to the city of Cincinnati. In addition to serving as the CEO of Ohio Citizen Action, Rachel sits on the steering committee of the Ohio Climate and Clean Energy Coalition. And she's a founding advisory board member of the Ohio Climate Justice Fund. Rachel also serves on the executive committee of the Regional Reamp Network. So Rachel, we're looking forward to today's conversation. Over to you. Thank you, Tatiana. Welcome everybody. Uh, and thanks for being a part of this sixth installment of OCA's Conversations Program Series. If you know me, you know I like to talk. So this was a wonderful opportunity to talk to wonderful people about amazing things happening in our state. We appreciate all of you who've been loyal listeners from the start and we welcome newbies to our convos table. I have to say I'm particularly excited about today's program because we've brought two of my favorite collabor co uh, collaborators, but frankly people, to the table for an especially timely discussion about climate change. At OCA, we start with the firm premise that real progress on climate change can only be made with equitable and just solutions. All people and communities have the right to equal, to equal environmental protection under the law and to the right to live work and play in communities that are safe and healthy. But how can this work be done effectively? What are some examples of successes and challenges in this area? 
what can we do to support these critical efforts? I can't think of two better people to help us answer some of these questions. Leah Hednall of the Ohio Climate Justice Fund and Crystal Davis of the Alliance of the Great Lakes. We're looking forward to the conversations and your questions, both about the specific work of the fund, as well as the broader work being done in Ohio in terms of racial justice and climate action. For new listeners, OCA is the premier grassroots mobilizing and organizing team in the Midwest. We organize and mobilize people in person, by phone and online, engaging our members and supporters in actions that protect public health, improve environmental quality, and benefit consumers. We've been at the heart of the fight to repeal and fully repeal HB6, which is not only hugely corrupt, but also seen as the worst climate policy in the nation. We're a grassroots engine of Power Clean Future Ohio, an expansive diverse coalition engaging with local governments across the state to build a clean climate future for our communities. And I'm also especially proud of involvement in the Ohio Climate Justice Fund an innovative participatory grant-making fund officially launched in 2021 that seeks to fund Black, Indigenous, and people of color, BIPOC-led or governed organizations in Ohio that are working at the intersection of racial justice and climate action. We believe a diverse co coalition of advocates will have more power to influence change that leads to a just and inclusive clean energy economy. OCJF is guided by an advisory committee of Ohio environmental advocates and leaders whose charge is to advise and guide investments in the BIPOC organizations working in this critical space. Crystal and myself are two of the founding members of the advisory board committee, and we're lucky enough to be able to hire Leah as the funds director. On that note, it's time to introduce our special guest. Crystal MC Davis is a respected professional with a career in, in government affairs that bloomed in Columbus and Washington, DC. She's currently with the Alliance for the Great Lakes as its Vice President of Policy and Strategy Engagement, leading the organization's efforts related to Lake Erie, drinking water policy advocacy and relationship building across the region. In 2016, Crystal founded the Thornton Buckeye Group, which is a government relations and public affairs firm that provides clients tactical advocacy, policy, communications, and other related services. Her previous experience includes stints with Kent State University, the Ohio House of Representatives, the Ohio Legislative Black Caucus, and the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. Crystal is a graduate of Kent State University, a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Inc., winner of the 2015 Ohio Trio Trailblazer Award, and a 2018 Cranes Cleveland Business 40 Under 40 honoree. Welcome, Crystal. Leah D. Hudnall is the director of the Ohio Climate Justice Fund. She's a principled and strategic leader with experience executing high impact community initiatives that build towards a stronger, bolder, and more racially just society. In 2020, Leah founded the Legacy Perspective, a civic consulting firm that offers project management, community engagement, and communication services to its client partners. As a black woman owned firm, the Legacy Perspective has worked with a range of partners from local frontline community organizations to regional and national foundations to develop people-centered strategies to champion the, champion the voices of those most affected by institutional decision makers. Leah began her career at the Key Bank Foundation and along her professional journey has held roles at the St. Luke's Foundation of Cleveland, the George Gund Foundation and the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office. Leah holds a bachelor's in communication and culture from Howard University and a master's in nonprofit administration from John Carroll University. She currently serves as a board member of Care Alliance Health Center, The Land, and Cleveland Votes. We're thrilled to have Crystal and Leah with us. Like Tatiana said, we'll begin today's program with a conversation amongst the three of us, then we'll open it up for your questions. Remember to type in your questions in the Q&A ch chat box below and watch the chat box as well for info, links, and resources. First, Leah, if we could start with you, I think it would be great to start with some basic but key information since the fund is new. Can you tell us about the Climate Justice Fund? When and why was it founded? Uh, what's its purpose? And is it true that OCJF is one of the first of its kind in the nation? Um, well, hello, everyone. Thanks, Rachel and the OCA team for having me here. 
Um, and so I'll jump right in with your last question. Um, as far as we know, there is not another statewide climate justice fund set up in the way that the OCJF is. So I will answer yes, as of today, right now at three o'clock. <laughs> um, stay tuned for that answer maybe to change. Um, but if I go back um, and really bring people up to speed on the origin and the purpose of the Climate Justice Fund, um, after the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd in 2020, coupled with the onset of COVID, um, many philanthropic partners across the country decided to increase their um, yearly spending. Uh, most only give about 5% of their portfolio per IRS guidelines, but many had made an agreement to go above that in 2020. One of those organizations was the George Gunn Foundation. And so what that did was create a, literally a pot of money um, that wasn't accounted for, that needed to be allocated in a short amount of time. And what the environmental director at the George Gunn Foundation decided to do was use a million dollars to um, regrant to frontline organizations that were working at the intersection of climate justice, racial justice, and democracy. Um, at the time that money was funded to the US Energy Foundation for safekeeping, um, and a few great folks across the state were tapped to come together as a committee to figure out how the dollars should be spent. Um, so this is hearsay because I wasn't there to witness it myself, um, but there were several different ideas and perspectives on how the money should have been spent. All of them were valuable takes given that there was a pandemic raging that no one knew about, masks were hard to find, communities were struggling. Um, some felt that the money should have been sunset, you know, regrants it out and be done with it. Um, others wanted to do different things and all, again, all of those ideas were valid. What eventually happened though was the development of what is now the Ohio Climate Justice Fund. The decision was made to really put some foundational elements around the program. So as you can see, the money was not sunset. We didn't spin down and close the doors. Um, what we decided to do was rebrand. So we grabbed a name, grabbed a logo and put it out into the public in April of 2021. And that was accompanied by a grant making program that allowed us to fund BIPOC governed or led organizations across Ohio. So that meant the executive director identified as a person of color or 50% or more of their board identified as persons of color. And they were able to apply for $15,000 to $30,000 grants to host three community listening sessions in their neighborhood about climate and clean energy. Um, the other piece to this is that the fund is participatory grant making. Usually when you apply for a grant, you apply uh, to a program officer who reviews your proposal and then makes a recommendation to their board about whether you'll receive money. In this case, you apply to the fund and that grant is reviewed by a panel of uh, community experts and leaders themselves, who in many cases are also fundraisers and nonprofit leaders. So it's not a program officer who is not responsible for you know, raising money and keeping an operating budget for an organization. These are literally environmental peers and leaders um, that are looking at um, these proposals. And so that makes it participatory. Of course, uh, not funding white-led organizations uh, made a big stir in the beginning. And, I stand by that. <laughs> um, that came from a lot of research in the field that shows nationally only about two to three percent of environmental philanthropic dollars go to non-white institutions um, over the course of the past decade. Um, and while we don't have $10 million, $20 million endowments here at the Climate Justice Fund, this was a step in the right direction we felt um, to kind of right size that. Um, so the Climate Justice Fund is a new initiative. It's a small machine that tries to do a lot of things in one. Um, and right now we are in our second year of programming. So I'll stop there. And if folks have questions or Rachel, what do you think? Thank you. That was wonderful and quite a rundown. And yeah, Crystal and I are two of the two of the cats that uh, Leah gets to herd. Um, and Crystal, I mean, I will ask you uh, as, as since we're both founding advisory board members, um, have you ever participated in a participatory grant making? I'm not, not I haven't either. And you've been in this work a lot. I mean, both of you have such long resumes. Uh, I'm thinking, man, I'm older than them and I got to get busy. Um, but I have to say, I it really has helped me to understand from both sides. And it's hard. You know, it's a, it's a hard process all the way around. So that's, that's really helpful. Um, OK, so let's talk a little bit as founding members, uh, Crystal. How, how, let's talk a bit about how we've seen the fund evolve over its short life. 
You know, just yesterday we were talking about the inequitable processes involved in grant making in general that we tried to start to address, for example. How else have you seen Ohio Climate Justice Fund evolve and change in this short time? I think that uh, the fund has been completely flexible throughout the time that we've uh, um, had the opportunity to work on it. I want to start by first giving kudos to uh, John Mitterholzer and the other funders who came together for this initiative because they very well could have, like Leah mentioned, just granted out the funds and decided, you know what, I want to do something well, I'm going to go with the people that I know. And instead, they decided to really defer to our leadership. And so we didn't have a lot of um, guardrails in our initial conversations. It was like, well, how much money should we give? Um, what are some of the um, criteria that we will be evaluating proposals on? What does the application look like? Um, and we were able to mold and create all of those different fields. And so I appreciate that opportunity. I think over time, we've learned through trial and error. We've learned the right amount of money that is um, just enough to make sure that it's not um, too much for a, a smaller a grassroots group to, to take on, but enough to be respectable so that they can actually have an impact in the community and further the great work that they were doing coupled with an environmental lens. Um, and we've learned about other things like um, we don't, things that really validated some of the decisions we made. We're glad that we didn't make an extensive uh, application um, yeah. that was to the point where it would make it burdensome for applicants to apply. Um, and we've been able to cultivate relationships with grantees. And so I think over time, we've um, really validated this entire experience and learned a lot about the do's and don'ts of how to go about this work. Oh, absolutely. I couldn't have said it better. Um, and I know that uh, we have the portal open uh, for this current uh, time. Um, and I know that we have uh, granted as of last year for the two cohort cohorts, 18 grants at almost not quite, but nearly half a million dollars, which is pretty amazing because many of the grantees, not all, but many of the grantees, this is, uh, they've told us this is the first time or one of the, for one of the first times they received money it may not be the first time they've applied for money. And I know how that, I know how that goes. Um, Leah, I had the opportunity to meet some of the grantees in the Cincinnati area last week, and they're doing some pretty cool stuff. Um, can you give us an update? Tell us uh, a little bit. I know we're in the pandemic and it's a, still a strange time, but can you tell us a little bit about the funds grantees and their critical work or, or even a little bit about a couple of the sessions that have happened? Yeah, um, so we funded again, as Rachel already stated, 18 organizations last year, um, and they spanned across seven cities everywhere between, of course, Cleveland, Columbus, and Cincinnati, Lima, Toledo, Dayton, um, and I'm missing some cities there, so I do apologize to those that I forgot, um, and each one of those organizations are different. Some are faith-based, some are um, have larger operating budgets, some are um, novice grant seekers, and this was their first go round at funding and this is for the sum 100th grant you know that they'll receive down the line um, and I think that that's very exciting when you can bring together a diverse cohort like that um, so the second thing I'll say is that again all of them were funded to host a minimum of three community listening sessions all of those sessions um, based on the conversations I've had with them look different I am not a micromanager so I don't show up in every city to oversee every event or you know anything like that um, but I do appreciate the fact that I approach these organizations and their leaders as um, respectful partners and they return the favor. And so they reach out to me and they let me know how it went or what their plans are. Some people are having um, or planning for family movie nights to make it an inclusive family event paired with conversation about climate. Some people are focused on the reentry conversation or the, excuse me, the reentry community and are centering their conversations on workforce. All of the, the events um, have similar content, but again, when you have a different organization with a different DNA and pulse, they all turn out differently. Um, so far, 17 have been held across the state. 
Um, the last time I checked on those numbers this week, it was seven upcoming. Um, every day the numbers change. Um, and then we have a slew that will probably start to pop up on our calendar once the weather breaks. A lot of people have been hosting webinars, of course, um, in light of COVID. And many of our partners are waiting for the sun to peek its face out here in Ohio so they can get outdoors and have some um, safe but in-person events. So I'm really excited. Oh, that's great. Good. That's a really good point about the time and the timing as well. Um, so I, I uh, will take a point of personal privilege here for a second and say I love working with Leah and Crystal and Jocelyn and Bishop Marcia and Samia. I've learned so much. I've been in this work for a long time, but I probably learned more in the last year and a half working with these ladies um, and, and others who were with us originally too um, than, than almost any time. Um, and I'd done a few press interviews recently as part of part of the, the board. Um, and recently I was asked how I as a white person relate to this movement. Um, and I and I wanted to I wanted to bring that up here because I know that's something that is difficult for some folks to think about, especially if they're very uh, haven't quite started their journey yet on these issues or are just about to start. Um, this is not particularly um, personal advice. This is uh, over the past number of years, me really paying attention. The most important thing I've learned in doing work on myself and systemic racism is that there's room for everyone in the fight for racial justice. It's work. It takes obviously takes a lot of work to break down such broken systems and every one of us is needed. I, I always think about this when people say the word inclusion, that means literally everybody, everybody, not not, um, oh, we're gonna change it to a different version of inclusion. This means everybody, we all have a role. And we also all have different networks to influence within our families, our friends, our colleagues. So, you know, me as a white person, I probably have a lot more white people to talk to. This is bigger than any one of us. This is, um, you know, in the Racial Equity Institute trainings, which I know we've, lots of us have taken, lots of folks in Cleveland, lots of groups have taken, they teach that we were all born into it. So it's everybody's responsibility to change it. And honestly, I think that's why doing your own self-transformation work uh, first is so important because everybody's lived experiences are so different, obviously. Um, so I wanted to say that because I think that is probably on some folks' mind. Um, I, I, uh, I'm lucky to get to work with Crystal and Leah and others. Um, very, um, very important opportunities to uh, transform within my own organization, for instance. I don't know how any organization or entity changes without the leadership changing. Leah, I read in a blog you wrote in the Cleveland Press Club that you never felt the environmental, before this, that the, you never felt the environmental sector was one in which you belonged. I know you're definitely not alone in that. So how has that sense informed your work in Ohio Climate Justice Fund? And do you have any commonalities or differences you see between foundation work and advocacy work that either uh, the board members or the grantees conduct? Um, yeah, so that's a big question. I'll try to give you a succinct answer. Um, there's in every sector, uh, every sector requires advocacy. Um, if we're complacent, um, if we just go with the flow and we're happy with what is happening, um, then we have seen what can result um, with inaction. Um, and so that is also true of philanthropy. Um, philanthropy has to be um, decentralized. It has to be uh, integrated. Philanthropy needs to be uh, rewritten all over. Um, it is a, a sector that's pervasive with nepotism and racism and classism. Um, and I indict it every week um, inside and out, and I'm happy to do so. Um, there's several books that are being written about decolonizing philanthropy, um, and I stand by a lot of the points that are made within those. Um, and so what I'll say is that as you all have dedicated your careers to the environmental justice movement, um, all of us know that none of these issues can be done alone on one track and they're all interdisciplinary. Um, and so as we crossed over, right, the Climate Justice Fund is a crossover between um, breaking a lot of the norms in philanthropy and also propelling and putting a platform on local leaders in the climate movement. Um, I think that there's a lot of promise when we come together, right? Um, I don't ever, ever 
<laughs> uh, consider myself an environmental justice leader. I don't ever get on platforms and start performing or acting as if I am one. Um, and I never make any promises that this is the sector that I'm gonna retire from. Um, but what I do commit myself to is anti-racist philanthropy. Um, and so in this opportunity, I've been able to do that and work with great environmental leaders like yourselves. Um, what I wrote in that blog that, I don't even remember what I wrote in full, um, but what I wrote in that blog stems from um, just personal feelings of turning on um, a, a interview or a city club event, or you know, just reading an op-ed um, and people are making it seem as though climate change should be the only issue for many people in America. And while it is a great danger, um, there's a whole part of this country and a whole part of this globe that doesn't have the privilege to focus on just one issue, um, even, if, even if it is an impending issue. And so um, I listen to a lot of, a lot of media. I'm a podcast junkie. And I just wanted to shout out this one podcast called Hot Take um, that I would really encourage you guys to listen to if you haven't, if it's not already in your repertoire, so I'm talking to the experts here. Um, but it's a great platform where they just talk about the real, real, real way that climate justice um, affects Black Americans and all Americans, and, but most especially people of color. Um, and I think that it's really important for us to really start having some honest conversation about the fact that we can care, right, about um, climate action, equitable climate action. And we could also be honest that um, some people in our lives may not consider it the number one priority right now. And so we can, we can do the work of making sure they can walk and chew gum, right? Um, and so that's where that came from. But hopefully that was helpful. Thank you, Leah. Oh, absolutely. I think that's a, I think that's, um, a, a perspective that you bring very particularly. Um, Crystal, how does uh, climate justice or the lack of it play out in the work you do every day related to the water issues facing the Great Lakes region? How does it in fact impact solving um, and policy making any of the things? Because you're you're both up in the Cleveland area, up at the Great Lake. I'm down in Cincinnati, so I don't get to see the lake much, but occasionally. So if you could just fill us in a little bit about how it how the interplay happens. Sure. Um, we know that social, racial, and economic justice are inseparable um, from environmental justice. We cannot achieve our vision of a Great Lakes enjoyed by all when systemic racism is allowed to permeate our society unchecked. I feel like I have to say that every presentation, every forum that I go in because uh, there's this notion that you can have a conversation about environmentalism without uh, recognizing the connection between racial justice and social and economic justice. And so um, I definitely wanna lift that up. It's a part of everything I do and why I'm a, um, the kind of the purpose behind my work at the Alliance for the Great Lakes. I'm vice president of policy, but um, there's a thread of um, environmental justice that goes through it all. Um, we know that water is a basic human need. And we also know that um, the natural, that natural resource has not been shared equitably across our Great Lakes states. Um, the, COVID pandemic has really exacerbated existing inequities. It wasn't the great equalizer. It didn't put us all on the same platform. It exacerbated existing inequities throughout our communities. There were several communities where um, I had a presence and was working and they did not have access to water. And they were told that to fight the virus, you need to wash your hands. And then when cloth masks came out, they had to wash their masks. And then the whole family had to work from home and they did not have water in the home. And that was something very real and people were suffering in the shadows. Um, when we talk about some of these water issues, you can tangibly see an algae bloom in the Great Lakes. It's easy to see it, undeniable, right? But the people who don't have water in their home look like you and I every day. They're not shooting it, shouting it from the the, the rooftops, hey, I don't have water at home. So they're struggling on a daily basis, going to work, doing all the things they have to do, and then suffering. And so it was a huge part of our work to really um, join forces with OCA and a number of other organizations across the region to combat um, stopping um, water shutoffs due to non-payment um, during this period. And it's still a priority for our organization. Absolutely, that's a really, really critical uh, and timely point also. Um, and, and one, like you said, it gets lost. People, people don't know. And it's not something that folks are gonna talk about much. It's a difficult problem, absolutely. 
Um, so this is for either both of you. Um, Robert Bullard, the sort of known as the father of environmental justice in America, has said that climate change impacts communities of colors first and worst. So what specific steps can we take to make sure local, state, and federal policies designed to fight climate change also better protect BIPOC communities on the front lines of what is a global crisis? I feel like Leah's giving me like the nod. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> We'll try to <laughs> um, I work with a lot of organizations on the front lines, especially here in Cleveland. We um, work to create a Cleveland comprehensive policy platform, environmental policy platform, um, and a resident engagement toolkit, a number of tools where we've been able to outline environmental policy priorities uh, for the area with tangible steps in, um, in terms of what we would like to see next. I think that um, it's really an issue of making sure that we're centering lived experiences and not talking very hypothetically about this work. Um, we have conversations about the state revolving fund, which is the main vehicle for funds to come from the federal government to the state. Are we making sure that those funds are being prioritized in areas that have been hit the hardest? not disadvantaged. I know that the federal government uses these lang this language like disadvantaged communities. I like to call them under-resourced communities because they just haven't gotten the attention and shine that they were due and deserve. And so it's really about making sure that we're prioritizing getting those hardest hit with the resources that are available and leveraging um, the moment. Um, right now we're talking about infrastructure dollars. Um, we need to make sure that those dollars are going to the communities that have the most lead service lines, that have uh, the, the, the worst health outcomes due to the environment. And so that's the larger conversation that I think needs to be happening on a daily basis. That's a really good point. Leah, did you want to add anything? No, nothing as, as, as great as that. Um, the one thing that I will say is that uh, as I sit and listen on many conversations, um, one of the things that I find, as Crystal just pointed out, is that things go very high level for apparently no reason, right? Because no one in their everyday life is speaking up here or living up here. People are living, <laughs> you know, in this normal realm. Um, and it's interesting to me because, you know, I'll just have to get real. People act like Black folk and people of color live these different lives. But the people that I know, the people that I identify with, and care about, are concerned about high energy costs. They're concerned about transportation. They're concerned about access to quality food. I mean, these are all things that climate impacts. Um, and so when people come and you know, do the wonky talk, it's like, no, these are experts of their lives and of their community. And they've been making a lot happen off of a little um, to Crystal's point of being under-resourced for generations. Um, and so the first thing you should probably do is, is listen, right? And it may not come out in these technical terms that you're, for whatever reason, looking for, um, but the truth will come out. Um, and so we, we in Cleveland, we do have climate action plans. As Crystal has stated in Northeast Ohio, there was a lot of movement, especially last year, to get residents equipped with the resources to make some good decisions um, in our local elections. And I really hope that that energy carries, carries throughout. That's a really good point. Thank you. That's yeah, that's a great. Um, along those lines from the state policy level, um, but uh, I will not, I am also not a uh, policy expert who lives up here. I know a few little things here and there, like, you know, aggregation is how we save some money and and uh, shut down coal plants by our, you know, utilities bill, right? So I, I, I get it because um, the big words are big words. And if you don't know what they mean, and I'm sitting in any meeting and you don't know what the acronyms mean, you're just, you're automatically lost, right? Um, so one of the problems we have in Ohio, uh, talk about people sort of living way up here, um, but also not, not doing their jobs, is that we have no statewide comprehensive energy policy. There's none. And so there's all these piecemeal things that happen. There has been a, a, an Ohio Energy Jobs and Justice Act introduced. Uh, the bill sponsors, uh, representatives K Casey Weinstein and Stephanie Howes, uh, said the Energy Jobs and Justice Act is a major step towards re restoring the Ohio promise of better jobs and brighter futures by implementing clean energy strategies 
that will reduce our reliance on fossil fuels and allow us to reap the benefits of clean energy job growth and development. If we do not embrace clean energy development, businesses will choose to locate in states that can cater to their sustainability goals. We cannot afford to be left behind in the clean energy economy. The Energy Jobs and Justice Act moves Ohio towards a progressive, well, progressive, yes, comprehensive and progressive clean energy policy rooted in equity, economic development, environmental justice, and accountability. And it ensures that Ohio emerges with an energy policy designed for all Ohioans. So uh, participants look in the chat box for more information about the bill and our and coalition efforts um, to pass it through the general legislature. We'd love you to join us in contacting your rep and urge its passage. Okay, so we've been talking about Ohio, um, but we would be remiss not to note that President Biden was just here in Ohio touting his infrastructure bill, and he made some news on the topic of climate justice. President Biden said he wants to alleviate the outsized burdens that Americans of color face from pollution. But he also said that using race to allocate help could mean legal trouble. And that's because of a conservative leaning Supreme Court that might reject a race-based approach to allocating federal benefits, or at least that's the thinking that, that they have. Instead, the White House will focus on economically disadvantaged communities. Some legal scholars agree, others don't, but activists expressed concern. What's your take? If we're leaving race out, how are we gonna fix this? Not just in terms of the Biden plan, but just more generally and more holistically. Because I'm gonna say right now, to me, leaving race out is like, you have not done the work. Because if, you, if you've even started your own work and understanding, you know it's just the, it's the basis of everything that's happening. So I, anyway, that was just a throw in there because I can't stand it. <laughs> Go ahead, Crystal. No, listen, I don't disagree with you. I think um, race is a huge part of this conversation that deserves a seat at the table, right? But I also am hyper-focused on solutions. And so um, whichever road we need to take to get there, I think it's important that we get there. Um, and I'm not willing to compromise my integrity in the process, but I think we need to stay focused on what matters here. I know that this issue can be controversial as there are people that are like, yes, um, whatever you got to do, president, let's go. And then there are others like, no, if you're not going to start with race, then you're not doing the, the work, right? Um, what I think is this is a distraction. This is a distraction from the larger conversation that needs to be had about what can be done at the federal level to really address the environmental issues and concerns and injustices that we've experienced for generations to come. We've seen some semblances of things that make us cautiously optimistic with the Justice 40 initiative and conversations about environmental justice at the federal level. We can look at the president's cabinet and see a lot more color than we have in past years, which gets us super excited. But I think what needs to happen at this juncture is really deep conversations about the individual policies. So I think there's a time and place to talk high level, and then there's a time and place to get into the weeds. And right now, we it's time to get into the weeds. It's time to start talking about the fact that the Justice 40 initiative is an amazing initiative that, that's happening and introduced at the federal level um, to encourage investment in addressing environmental injustices. However, that doesn't include the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, which is one of the major uh, pieces of legislation and initiatives that help uh, address our, our issues across the Great Lakes. And so I was happy to work with the Healing Our Waters Coalition a couple of years ago to do an equity analysis of the GLRI, which needs to happen for most of the federal programs. It's not an indictment on the programs or their creations. They're amazing programs, but they were created in a time where they weren't focused on environmental justice like they should have been, right? And so now it's time to do inventory. Now it's time to do the audit and talk about how that RFP looks. This is the RFP, again, talking in such a uh, weighty language that people in communities don't have the ability to apply for the program. Do we have set-asides to make sure that we are addressing the communities that are hit the hardest? Those are the conversations I'm more willing to have than to argue about um, the terminology and doing the deep work because we know that these systems were never created with people like me in mind anyway. So I don't have the, uh, the, the energy to kind of go back and forth on that. I wanna be solutions oriented with, with all of this work. 
That's a really, that's a really good point. Um, and one that I think is, is worth acknowledging that things, it, nothing happens in a vacuum, right? So over the course of time, um, who knows how long it would take to get this to come up if, if it wasn't coming up now, if it wasn't, um, you're right, it's about solutions and, and the granular level so critical not to, not to miss. Before I ask this last question, I wanna remind people that we wanna take your questions. If you haven't already, please add them in the Q&A box and we'll get to those in a minute. Okay, so the last but critical question. I wanna arm our listeners with the basic premise, not only to think about, but to inform their efforts moving forward. So when somebody asks us, why does climate justice matter? What's your best response to cut through the crap and just get right to the point? Um, well, if I were to pitch an elevator speech here, um, the food that I eat matters, the air that I breathe, the air that my son breathes, and that my family breathes matters, um, the conditions of our community, um, if they are safe and protected um, from winter storms and other risky weather events, all of that matters, and all of that can be directly linked back to expedient climate change. Like, I, I don't know another way to put it. Um, there's no, you know, I think climate has become politicized. It's become, it's been made so difficult for no reason. Um, emissions that are in the air are heating up the planet and we need to stop it. That's, I mean, it's just that simple <laughs> and we can get off the elevator um, with just saying that. So I think that's the way that I would cut through. Um, it matters because we all matter. Um, but I'm going to be selfish, especially me, right? <laughs> but um, I think we all feel like that. And, you know, I, I don't know another way to put it. Maybe maybe Crystal can help us out. I don't know. <laughs> I think my response to that is mattering is the minimum. When we say Black lives matter, that's the minimum. We shouldn't even be talking about the fact that I matter because that's the minimum. Climate change matters. Climate justice matters. That is the baseline. That is the minimum of the discussion. That is not even something that's on the table. I think at the issue, um, we're at the juncture now where um, we really need to know that what happens in the climate and in our environment impact every part of our lives. And I challenge folks on this because I uh, have the uh, difficult task of going to the legislature and talking with legislators to make sure that they understand the importance of these issues. And as a former House of Representatives staffer, I understand that they're faced with uh, hundreds of people on a daily basis. And every um, person that comes in feels like their issue is the priority. And I appreciate that, right? I'm not, I'm not in a position to tell somebody in education that environment matters more than education or healthcare or economics. But I am here to say that your economic, there is a, there is an economic impact to climate justice. There is an education impact to climate justice. There's a health impact to climate justice and it permeates every part of our society. And so again, mattering is the minimum because it affects every part of your life. And if you tell me something you care about and I, could I can easily tell you how the environment is associated with that thing. That's really critical. Both of you, that was really, really, really helpful. Um, and in your point too about the, you know, it mattering is the floor, not the ceiling sort of a thing is so critical, you know, because um, we're, we need to build power for all of our future. And it, in, you're right, it intersects with absolutely everything, all of our issues, everything we're talking today, right? Everything we're talking about today affects all of us in different ways, different days, different, different times. Um, but we all are part of the solution to get back to Crystal's point. Um, okay, so now it's time to take some questions from our audience. Um, let me see. Okay, so in terms of Ohio Climate Justice Fund, has the act of funding these grassroots groups created unforeseen opportunities for collaboration or for them to get their, their name and their work out there? Can I throw that out to you, Leah? Uh, sure. Uh, I think the Climate Justice Fund sets up a lot of different opportunities. Um, one, of course, um, what 
personally, I would love to be able to remind people is that many of these organizations are frontline orgs. They're ran by people who are uh, doing several different things for their community at once. And they don't have the privilege of just being the executive director of said organization. Um, and so this gives them the opportunity to be on a platform where other funders can also understand the work that they've been doing. We're not creating any orgs at the Climate Justice Fund. We're simply partnering with those that have already existed, have already been doing the work, and just so happen to take a chance on the Climate Justice Fund and apply. Um, and so I think in return, what we should be doing, of course, is elevating them to folks who maybe have would never have been connected otherwise. Um, the other piece that I think is really important in terms of the opportunity is that they connect with one another. Um, and so oftentimes when you're so focused on the work that you're doing in the area that you know best, you don't have time to come up and breathe and talk to the people that are doing it, you know, two hours away, maybe in Cleveland or in Warren or in Toledo. And so it allows the grantees within the cohorts to come together and say, we're working on the same thing. What type of issues have you seen? How have you created solutions for those? And how can we exchange ideas? That's a really good point. And, and frankly, also what, uh, you know, we're doing within the fund ourselves with the, with the particip participation. Um, I don't work on the same issues as Crystal every day, and she doesn't work on the same issues as me, but, you know, we have the same view about all of this uh, regarding why we're part of the Climate Justice Fund. And, you know, I being Cincinnati and Cleveland being so far apart, I've noticed that even those of us who've been in the work quite a long time, it takes a lot to get to even meet each other. And so within the fund um, grantees, people who maybe they don't have any staff, maybe it's completely volunteer, maybe it's, uh, you know, or maybe it's something that's, um, uh, you know, just getting started in this work, environmental justice work, for instance. So it's it having that um, we're not alone, you know, feeling is so critical in this work. I, I don't know how I would have gotten through any nonprofit work like this if it wasn't for other people like that. Um, uh, the realities of climate change will be felt far more by future generations. I know you're both parents. Uh, and when you think of the Climate Justice Fund and your work generally, how has the fact that future generations um, will, be, will be really the most impacted? How has that guided your work? And is there other ways that grantees can help people organize, especially young people, um, become involved in climate justice? Yeah, I'm reminded, I, I work closely with the Junction Coalition in Toledo, we the people of Detroit, who have large groups of young people that work with them on a daily basis, and it's probably the best part of my job. Um, I love being corrected by them, because there was a time when, you know, it's kind of cliche, you say, the children are our future, and we're talking about future generations, and they were like, um, Miss Crystal, we're the present. You know, yeah, we're the future, but we're living through what you're living through right now. And so I think that's important to remember. We're talking about them being leaders down the road. They're leading the way right now. And they've experienced this pandemic the way we have. They're exp experiencing the inequities in their communities and the health impacts associated with that and the economic impacts associated with that right now. It's definitely a driver. Um, and I think part of what I'm super focused on right now is trying to find out how to break the table. Um, a lot of conversations talk about, oh, we need to pull more folks up to the table and give youth a seat at the table. And um, I have a board member at the Alliance who reminded me that the table was never created for all of us anyway. It's time to break the table and build a new table that's designed for everybody that should be there, including our youth. And so what I'm really focused on doing is making sure that we have youth voice at the State House, at uh, Capitol Hill, at City Hall, at County Council, and everywhere else. And so their voices are being amplified in terms of how they're experiencing and how they intend to later experience these same uh, environmental issues that we're discussing. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. So the finite table needs to be broken and we need to basically an infinite table yes. or whatever yeah. that looks like. Yeah. We yeah. need something that has a lot something more different than what it looks like right now. Really <laughs> different. Hopefully a lot more interesting, more fun, more colorful, 
smarter solutions all the way around because none of us are smarter than all of us together is what uh, so many people and I learned that from an organizing training that Reamp helped to do I just remember that because it's so true in everything we're doing. Um, there was a question about could we talk a bit more about how community or maybe just remind folks about how communities and organizations find out about Ohio Climate Justice Fund. So if somebody's just tuning in today and maybe they were even let's say a few minutes late, how would they what would they need to do, where would they need to go i'm going to throw that to you Leah so I don't get it wrong. Oh, no problem um, you can visit Ohio climate justice fund.org you can follow us on Twitter Facebook or LinkedIn. Uh, we have engaging social media pages, so feel free to follow us. Um, we have a lot of resources available on the website, so it's probably more than you were looking for, but it's good reading. Um, and there also on the website, of course, is where you can find more information about the grant opportunity and the employment opportunities. That's great. Oh, yes, great. Also, the employment opportunities. That's a good point. Um, and uh, one other thing I want to say that, you know, as, as um, somebody who had to kind of Figure, figure some of the grant writing uh, pieces of my job out a little bit on my own, not completely, but a little bit. Um, I've One thing I'm really proud of, and, and I'm excited that it was a whole collaboration, is that there's a lot of support from the minute people are interested in coming in and learning about it to uh, how do we put these on, you know, okay, we've got funding, how do we put these on, what do we do, and, and um, some of the technical and communication support. And that doesn't no normally happen um, from, from where I've sat. <laughs> Let's put it that way. It's usually you're on your own, you know, uh, if we even get funded. So I think that that's kind of a nice difference also that um, that there's some opportunities like that as well. Um, uh, okay, so a participant asked, uh, I work for a small solar installer. What advice do you have for a business like us to fight for climate justice in our world? So if there's, if we're talking about everybody, you know, everybody being involved, how would a small solar installer, how would, what would we encourage uh, to happen to be involved in this work? Well, one, I mean, again, I think there's several different opinions just even on this panel. Um, but if I were to answer that question, I think the one thing that we can control is ourselves. Um, and so if I own a business and I'm trying to see how I can make an impact based on the conversation that was held today, are people most affected and most impacted a part of your business model? Maybe you can't go out and hire a dozen people from community today, but is there a plan or a way to include? So when you're on projects in communities, right, you're always in someone's home. <laughs> whether you know someone's home neighborhood whether you think about a project that way or not are you engaging those people around right the project that you're working on in terms of solar installation do they know what you're doing do they know who you are um, or are you just showing up right so all of these I mean I feel like we lose these these basic uh, lessons that we learn as children right you speak when you enter a room you introduce yourself you you know you're pleasant and we grow up and we just lose all of that. That still should happen <laughs> as a business owner. Um, and so when I go into community, I don't ever assume that I just have a right to be there. Um, and so again, I think that one of the ways that we can really start is by knowing that it's not gonna happen, Rachel, as you said, by ourselves, um, but we can take some individual action to really move the needle on this. And as it's been expressed already, it's an economic issue as well. So employing people is always the right step. So mm -hmm. just my two cents. That's a good point. Um, I don't watch reality TV, but I am gonna use a quote from it because it's perfect from what you're saying. Uh, a long time ago, somebody on some reality TV said, I, I didn't come here to make friends. It's a game, I, you know, I didn't come here to make friends. I did come here to make friends. And having that kind of a perspective, whether you're working, whether you're at church, whether you're, you know, talking to your neighbor, uh, whatever, um, I think has helped me in my organizing. And I, I see the most connections in all the work that we're doing together. I've also made the, the um, possibly the most interesting friendships with anybody I could meet through this past year in this work, um, who, you know, we have some things in common, but I, I you know, we don't have everything in common, obviously. So I can say personally, you've all enriched my lives, my life per personally. Um, all right, so let's see here. Um, oh, here's a good one. 
have, I know we're getting close here. Have we, have you found that the groups you fund already have some kind of environmental focus or are they usually starting with our grants or maybe a combination? Uh, I'll take it if no one wants to, but um, yeah, they, it's, it's, a, it's a, a mix. Um, all of them, the, the commonality is that all of them understand the importance of um, climate action and environmental justice. And again, many of these organizations are serving communities whole needs. So they don't have the privilege to just siphon out um, EJ as a part of their mission. Um, but again, because they understand the importance, they do a, a series of different work. So we have many community service organizations that have food pantries and they're hosting climate talks, right? Um, you can do both at the same time. So it, it's a good mix of uh, missions and visions that come together on this. Oh, absolutely. And that's, and that's a great reminder that this is all intersectional again, right? It's all intersectional. Um, it's been neat to see the diversity of, of the applicants and what they, what they, um, what they want to do, how they want to do it. Because while we do give some guidelines to make it a little bit easier to not be overwhelmed, like Crystal said, which I've, I've been myself at times, um, but to also have that creativity that comes with, from the actual community. Mm -hmm. All right, so let me wrap this up. Um, remember to check out the chat box for all kinds of helpful links about the discussion and the work of the amazing guests, Leah and Crystal. Thank you for being here. Um, please also follow Ohio Citizen Action and Climate Justice Fund via Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Remember to join our special repeal HB6 Facebook page, a closed page for all the latest there. Check out our website, ohiocitizen.org. You can sign up for our email action list on the homepage and become an OCA member. To join our texting program, text add add to 216-586-6511. You can check out our other campaign sites at repealhb6.com and watching P-U-C-O, watching P-U-C-O.com. And you can subscri subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find a recording of this conversation, uh, past convos with Rachel we've held, and other original Ohio Citizen Action content. I want to thank all the guests and audience members. Um, I want to thank the Ohio Citizen Action staff who puts a lot of time and energy into this and helping people like Crystal and myself and Leah all be able to talk uh, really so, so easily about these issues in a way, well, not easily is not the right word, but in a way that we can all understand. Because it, if, it's not, if it's not inclusive language, it's not inclusive. <laughs> So um, I wanna urge people to watch out for our next Convos installment in April. Um, it's around Earth Day usually, and it, this will conclude the program. Thank you again for attending. Thank you, Leah and Crystal. I look forward to working with you and seeing your faces again soon. Thank you. Thank you.